Now, Ms. Mick's speaker is uh, Ben Tate. Uh, Ben's uh, had a, a, a ten year history of working on floodplains. He's now the principal engineer with uh, Water Technologies and he's been doing hydrodynamic modelling in Barma Miller Forest. Thanks, everyone. Okie dokie. So as uh, Keith said, uh, my name's Ben Tate and I'm going to quickly sort of talk to you about the um, hydrodynamic modelling that we've done on Varma over a number of years now. Um, not focused so much on, you know, the, the technical jargon and the background behind the modelling, but I guess the key point that I wanted to get across is um, what we can do with the model and how it might be um, useful for, for a lot of you guys in the room. So. Um, you know, what, why do we go about putting effort into into creating these models? Why don't we just go out and have a look at it on the on the ground? Well, I guess um, um, there's a few few things to consider there. So I guess we've got very limited resources in terms of money and uh, and water as well. Um, and also, if we make some sort of change in a sensitive environment like Barma, Gumbauer, and so on the environmental consequences can be very high. So we really want to put a lot of effort into understanding what might happen before we actually go and do something. Um, another, another key point there, I guess there are a lot of um, studies that have used things like, like satellite images and things to get a, a snapshot of what's happened in the past. And that's great for, I guess, understanding what happened in the past. But um, I guess that doesn't lead you to, a, to sort of uh, play you know, what if scenario, so you know, what if we put a regulator in here or um, what if we uh, change the flow distribution through the different regulators along the Murray and so on, um, whereas the modelling allows you to, to sort of play around with those sort of scenarios. Um, so I guess, uh, you know, I could talk about all the, the uh, complicated um, uh, physical numerical equations and things that go into the models, but what it all boils down to is uh, that the model is basically a tool for water managers to assist water managers make uh, the best decisions. And there's a whole lot of uh, things that you can get out of the models in terms of um, um, spatial and temporal distributions of, of flood extents and depths and velocities and flows and all sorts of things. So um, it's a very, very uh, strong, um, powerful sort of tool for, for water managers. One of the key things in when you're actually setting up your model and designing sort of what, what it's going to look like um, is to consider what you want out of it at the at the outset. So, if you want to know what's the velocity of that root ball down there on that tree, you don't go and build a model of the entire Barm and Miller Forest, for instance. Um, so, I guess the key thing that you need to, to do some of this modelling. You need a, um, a really good uh, topographic data set, particularly if you want to do sort of 2D modelling, which I'll show some images of later. The key data set is, is uh, LiDAR data. And um, with, uh, with the evolution of that over the last sort of uh, 10 years or so, and uh, I guess the cost of that coming down, we've now got a really wide coverage of LiDAR across the whole state, which has really led to um, to us being able to do some quite good modelling on, on um, floodplains and wetlands. So, um, as I said before, lots of things that you can get out of these models, so um, all sorts of different things there that, that, that we're able to sort of interrogate for Barma. And I guess the, the scale of the model that we that we uh, developed for, for Barma had the upstream boundary was at, at Toke and um, downstream boundaries at sort of Barma and Daniloquin. So, covered a, a huge area which presented some challenges just being you know such a big scale so this is sort of a bit of a snapshot of, of what the, the model looks like so the all the uh, the colors in the background is the, the basically the lidar grid um, sort of resampled at, at 50 meters so 50 meter squares um, grids get grids there every grid point has its own um, topographic value. So, I mean, we developed grids a lot finer than that, you know, down to like one metre resolution, so you can get fantastic uh, resolution on your results and things, but 
at this scale, that's not achievable. That if you tried to do that, that uh, well, if you if you could get it to run, it would take a year or so to, to run a model simulation, which is obviously it's not practical. Um, the black lines there are the major, the the river and the, some of the major creeks, um, and all of the regulators. They're modelled in a little bit more detail, in uh, a one-dimensional model, um, which is sort of linked to the two-dimensional model. So it allows um, allows you to to model some of those smaller linear features like the rivers and the waterways in, in a bit more detail. Um, so how does it all work? Well, I guess it starts off with um, some, some flow, flow gauging. So that's the, uh, the gauge at, at Tokemal, uh, a bit upstream of, of the forest. Um, basically take that sort of flow gauge, um, or you might have multiple inputs, put that into sort of your model and then the, um, the topography of the model sort of dictates where all the flow is going, how fast it's going, how high it gets and so on. Now, I guess uh, an interesting point there is that we think of that 2010-11 event as, as a, a pretty pretty big event, you know, it got up over 90,000 megaday at Tog. Um, but to put that in, in context, that's sort of, at Tog, around about a 10 to 20% annual exceedance probability event. So. It's not huge in flood terms. I mean, that red one there is the 1956 um, flood. You can see there we've about double the, the peak flow, a uh, lot longer duration, bigger volumes. So although you know we think of that last event as a pretty big event, in the context of the history of Barmer, it's, it's not so big. So how does it all work? Well, we've got that 1D model, as I, as I said, that. Um, sort of represents the linear features like the rivers and the waterways. Um, so the model um, using sort of numerical equations works out how high and how fast the water travels down those creeks. And then when, when it gets up to the top of the bank then it um, spills out into the 2D model which is sort of when uh, the, the LIDAR sort of dictates where all the water's going. And that's, uh, that's when the magic happens. Let's have a look, see if this, see if this works. So we're looking upstream, looking downstream there. So you can see the, 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 the Murray um, bending around, running off down to Barmer on that side, and heading up to Daniloquin on, on this side, on the Edward. So we're starting here from about the 1st of September and um, running through to, um, about, I think, the 1st of March 2012. So you can see um, the floodplain um, sort of wetting up and, and, and being inundated by that, that first peak that went through, draining, um, you can see all the, the, the lakes are down in the, in the top corner there, remaining um, full, but the rest of the forest sort of draining away slowly over the months, um, and shortly you'll see the, the, the second peak go through. It's getting there. So you can sort of see um, from a visual point, it's, it's, it's quite um, a really quick and easy way to actually um, to, to get across to, to, to people sort of the, the, the scale of, of the event and, and so on. And you can visually see different systems in different areas and which ones flooded and which ones didn't. But, but then you can drill down in a lot more detail and uh, start looking at like, just how deep was it in that wetland or um, what was the velocity at this point? So you know, what's the the, the the scour potential and all those sort of things. So I might just wind it up there and we'll skip on. So you know, it it, it looks really good, but uh, how good is it? Um, what's the calibration like? So on. So for this event, um, we calibrated using a number of different data sources. So. There's some gauge flows on all of the regulators, uh, or on some of the regulators. Um, so we can look at, at water level and, and flow um, hydrographs and compare the model to the, to the, um, to the observed. We can look at satellite images, um, that, uh, like similar to what Mohammed talked about before. Um, so we can compare um, those satellite images to um, snapshots of the model and see how they, how they marry up. And uh, another good way to, to, to just to make sure you're, you're not um, doing anything silly in that model is to check sort of a like a cumulative volume trace as well. So this is 
you know, downstream at, um, at Barmer, I think. So just making sure that your model's um, modeling the volume correctly. Um, so those satellite images um, were captured on uh, those three dates there. Now that's, uh, that, that uh, trace there is toke, so I guess you need to sort of understand there's a bit of a delay between Tokemal and, and the forest. So although that image on the 27th of December uh, you know, looks like it's captured after the peak of the flood. That was, was pretty close to, to the peak actually in the forest. So that's the visual um, image. Um, and I'm not going to spend too long talking about it because Mohammed covered it really well. Um, but um, MDBA did, um, this was a project in conjunction with MDBA and CMA and the two parks authorities and, and so on. MDBA did the um, the end member analysis that Mohammed talked about. I'm not sure if, did they get you to do that, Mohammed? Or? Yeah, yeah. yeah, well there you go. So you can have confidence that it was all done very well. Um, so you can see, I guess, the, the dark colours there are, are, the, are the areas where, um, where there's flood waters. Uh, that, so that's the, the sort of end member analysis. So I'll just flick, flick between it a little bit and uh, So you can sort of see there, those dark colours really correspond to the areas in the end member analysis that are coming up as flood. So then if I now flick between that and um, our model results, you'll see that, so these, these are shaded by depth for our model results, you see it's quite a good um, correlation there. Second <coughs> image um, later on in the event, 1st of March, you can see there it's a lot more sort of uh, Ready colours, um, which are, I guess, the uh, sort of the the often the higher ground where, where vegetation is growing and, and things, um, grasses and so on. Um, and in the end member analysis, you can see there's a lot of lot more dry areas through the forest. So then we compare that to the model results, and again, you know, it's coming out quite quite good in the extent there. So um, what, what do you then do with all these model results after you've got something that looks pretty good and you're reasonably happy with how it's calibrated? Well, we've used it um, to, to look at uh, a number of things. One of the interesting ones was looking at, I guess, the flow splits through the different regulators. And um, you know, there's, there's, there's a stack of regulators through that, mar through that um, Barmer reach. So understanding how much actually does go through each one into, and you know, what's the split between New South Wales and, Victoria, all those sort of things as well, um, and that makes that's quite useful for making decisions around. Um, if I open up this regulator, how much water am I um, taking from the river? And you know, water accounting is quite important these days. Um, we also looked at um, uh, sort of maps of uh, extents for different flow rates, for, so particularly around the sort of small, you know. The, the typical flow rates that you might be playing with for management, for instance. So what areas can, can get inundated for different flows? And we looked at different scenarios there with just Victorian regulators open, New South Wales regulators open, or a combination. Can then split it further into things like, um, well, what, what um, vegetation categories are inundated and how much area is inundated um, in those different events? So you can start to sort of then target specific um, uh, um, specific sort of uh, sites and and uh, water regimes in in your management event. You can put together some nice maps and things. So this map, I guess, shows one scenario. It shows a flow of sixty thousand meg a day with regulators on both sides of the river open, and it's been mapped so that each of those colours corresponds to an area inundated for a particular um, EVC type or vegetation community. So you can start to sort of put together some a, a, a quite, quite uh, detailed information that would assist you in sort of um, actually working out what you're going to get out of this flow event. Um, some of the other really interesting things we found, so at um, at, at low river flows, I guess there was some concern that if, if we opened up a lot of the regulators along the, the river that we wouldn't get enough flow at, um, at Gulper Creek to, and, and it, to head sort of north into the Edwards and so on. So we looked at um, 
at, at, at those low flows and how much water is, uh, I guess, used in the forest and how much is sort of left remaining to go down, um, down the gulper and so on. And we actually came up with some, some quite interesting results in that at sort of um, 13,000 meg a day, even if you opened up every regulator along, uh, along the river there, you'd still get 17,000 meg a day down Gulper Creek, which, which was quite surprising. So um, yeah, so I think that gave us some, some scope there to, for future management to, to, to sort of have a bit of confidence that even at low flows in the Murray, we, we can still play a bit with some of the little regulators and get some water into wetlands without having too much impact on, on uh, the river. Um, so I guess now I, I, the thing that I really want to get across is that we can, um, those scenarios have been run, the results are sitting there, it's, it's not a big deal to post process them in any different way you can think of, um, you know, spatial extents in, in the GIS, um, depths and hydrographs at any point in the model, things like that. So I mean if th this model's sitting there, it can be used. Um, and really it's, it's limited by your imagination. So anything you want to do with it, it's there. So uh, I was talking to someone last night actually about the, the sort of new, the rebranding of the state. So I guess my take home message might, I'll change this a little bit, is that the Barma Millibot Forest uh, hydrodynamic model's there and it's open for business. So. <laughs>